Hello and uh, welcome to this uh, SPSS introduction. So this um, video is to show you around the program SPSS in a brief introduction and then you can use the uh, exercise instructions that are also online to get familiar with the program yourself. So first let me say what SPSS is. SPSS, the abbreviation, abbreviation stands for Statistics, I think program in the social sciences. I think that's uh, the original abbreviation, but now people just use it as a, as a as a name for the program, and it's not just for the social sciences either. Um, what it does, it is basically a glorified calculator in that it just sees numbers and it does some math on those on those numbers for you. I say this to say, um, you are the researcher and you need to kind of know what you're doing. So the program will do dumb stuff for you if you ask it to make to do dumb stuff. Um, I'll, uh, the way this is going to work, I'm going to show you what the program looks like and then I'll uh, explain how you can access the program uh, also remotely if you if you choose to use it remotely. Um, first, also in the course manual for this course, there's going to be a list. Uh, you'll find a list of all uh, sorts of different programs that can do statistics. Uh, SPSS is just one of them. It's a it's a fairly popular one. Um, I think in recent years there's been other programs that have gained have been gaining more ground for several reasons. Um, the program itself is not ideal. I want to manage your expectations with this a little bit because the program can be very frustrating for several reasons. One is um, the development of the program has been such that newer additions to the program kind of have a different logic in the way you kind of. Uh, use the program. The, the interface will be slightly different for different parts of the program, which is very frustrating if you're new to it. Um, you'll get to ha the hang of it, have a hang of it at some point, but it's going to be slightly frustrating. And the second uh, thing is that um, things are not always, I think, mm, commonsensical if you're used to a modern visual language. So some of these things were Basically, it was essentially developed in, in like the 90s or early 2000s. And at the time, of course, visual languages were, were kind of different to what you're used to in a modern interface. And it's just not a priority for the development of a program like SPSS because its user base is people who've been using it for decades and they don't want to change all that much, most likely. So I think that's part of the reason. And the final thing is that even after all that stuff, um, SPSS has some bugs that make it crash sometimes, I've noticed during the sessions that I've done. Um, so it's going to be slightly frustrating, on top of just the fact that you're learning a new program that you're not used to, which in itself can be frustrating. I don't mean to discourage you, I don't just want you to kind of know what you're getting into with this. Um, having said all of that, though, I think compared to the alternatives that I mentioned that are in your course manual as well, SPSS is relatively, not in absolute terms, but relatively it is easier to get into. The reason for this is that as opposed to its alternatives, it uses um, a visual interface. So there's menus to, to use, uh, there's boxes to tick, there's variables to drag. Uh, it's, it's fairly visual uh, in, in, in principle. Um, not that you can't use a programming language, we'll get into that in a second, um, but in principle you can start with just using menus, which is uh, a less steep learning curve. The alternatives, so there's uh, programs like uh, letter R, uh, Stata, SAS, there's a whole range of programs, but most of those will rely uh, quite heavily on you programming the things that you want, or at least typing commands into a console, so text-based. Uh, which is a much steeper learning curve. Um, in, in Research Methods 2, we always try to have some moment where you can get acquainted, if you choose to, with some of those programs. Uh, but for now, we're starting with SPSS, which is relatively easier, even if it still is fairly frustrating at the time, at some times. Okay, so um, let me first tell you how you can, uh, I'm closing my presentation here, how you can access the program remotely. So first of all, um, you can install it on your computer. If you go, if you if you have installed it and you just type SPSS, it will be the first result on your computer. Most of you will not have it installed, but just in case that's what you want, the um, university has a website to um, install programs. However, at the time of this video, that website is not working because of the recent um, cyber attacks at the university. I think that at some point in the future, this this website will uh, work again. So it's software.masteruniversity.nl. 
Um, from there, you could uh, download the program, install it. You need to have um, either a, at, be at the Wi-Fi network of the university to do that, because uh, it accesses a licensing server in the process, or you'd have to establish a VPN connection to the university. For any of that, you can go to uh, the ICT information pages of the university, and they will show up if you Google ICTS. Maastricht University. From here, you can uh, get to all the manuals, right? So that's over here on the manuals and information to set up a VPN and all that stuff. Um, if that's not what you want to do and you don't expect to use SPSS in the um, intermediate term, at least, um, you can also choose to install the trial for SPSS from, uh, from the manufacturer, which is IBM. Um, so you just Google I, SPSS trial, and I'm sure you find it at some point. Um, this is SPSS modeler. I'm not sure if that's the same one, if they renamed it. The issue with this is, let me just see first if I can find SPSS on that side. I should have prepared this maybe. <laughs> um, uh, yes, here we go. So it's this link. So go through the website, go through the menu. I, I'm sure this menu might change in the in the near future if when you're doing it. But uh, you can find it. So it says try SPSS for free. And um, there's even a student edition available. I'm not sure what that would cost. But don't go and buy it. You can get it from the university. Uh, so here's a trial. You fill this in and you, you get the you get the software for, I think it's it used to be 30 days, so that's probably what it is. So if all you need to do is just exercise this now, that, that suffices. The downside of doing it this way will be that the um, uh, version will be newer, of course, it's the most recent version. The version at the university will be slightly older, so it's possible that some small details might be different. Although, like I said, the program doesn't re usually change all that much, So, which is in this case is a, is a positive, right? So that's another thing. Then uh, there's, um, of course, the computers at the university themselves, but the, you might have reasons not to want to use them at the moment. Um, but as far as I know, all of the computers that uh, the university has, they have an SPSS installed too. So that's uh, an option. Then the final thing, and maybe that is actually the um, most convenient way for you to do it, is to use something called Student Desktop Anywhere, Athena Desktop. There's different ways, uh, different names going around for this. I can't show you your student portal but because I'm not a student, but the student portal kind of looks like something like this. Yeah, so let me see if I can make this bigger. Oh, it's going to go to a page, but yeah. So it looks like this. You've seen it. Uh, under student portal, there will be a section called uh, ICTS, and under that, there will be a link called Show More. If, when you click that, there will be an option to select something called Athena Desktop. Alternatively, you can go directly to the link, which is this, athena desktop.maastrichtuniversity.nl. When you go to this, you get this login page. Uh, you fill in your, your student ID and your password. You click login. You'll notice um, I'm not entitled to use the system because, again, I'm not a student. So I can't show you on this. But what you'll get if you do this is basically uh, what you get if you log in to a computer at the university. So it's like as if you're using a computer at the university. Uh, and the the desktop for that computer, including the start menu and uh, SPSS and all that stuff, will uh, show within your browser window. After that, what I would do if I were you is to say, uh, click here, if you're using Chrome, but other browsers have a similar place to put this, and then click a button that, that looks like this, which makes um, your screen full size. The reason for this is that um, uh, you might want to make it full size because there will be menus in SPSS that otherwise won't show things like the OK button that you need to press to run uh, an instruction. And so when you make your browser full screen, that, that will work. So look up, uh, if you don't, can, can't figure it out, look up for your respective browser, if it's Safari or Edge or Chrome or whatever, how to make uh, a thing, uh, your screen full, full screen, to make your browser window full screen. That will work uh, pretty well, most likely. Yeah, so these are three ways. So either Athena Desktop or install a trial or find some way to get the uh, university um, license for your computer. Yeah. For the latter, by the way, you will have to also set up a VPN connection. So that's uh, Google that under the 
ICT as support things. Okay, so that's a lot of stuff to tell you just to get started and in SPSS. Of course, I have it installed on my computer here, so I can just show you um, what it looks like. The slides that you see here, I'm not going to show you them here because I just want to show you the program itself. Considering this is a video, it's easier to just go through what it actually looks like. Um, but these slides, if you want to look at them, they are on uh, Student Portal also. All right, so speaking of Student Portal, under this course, it looks slightly different for you than it does for me, but it should be similar. Under Course Materials, there is going to be a folder called Lab Session. And under there, you will see a couple of files. This, depending on the time you watch this, may not be available yet. That's the answer key. And the answer key will be available after all the sessions have run. But most importantly, we have this the lab session exercise instructions. That's a PDF for you to look at. Uh, I'll show you that in a second. Then there's two data sets. The instructions will tell you when to open these exactly in SPSS. And these are the slides that I just showed you. These. Yeah? If you want to go over them, you can. And the exercise instruction answer key is um, just answers to whatever it is that you will be doing in here, including some exp explanations as to why these answers are the way they are. So check that out and compare it to there, to the instructions that you did. So the instructions then are look like this. It's a PDF, like I said, and there's basically two parts to this. It's descriptive statistics. And there's, let's scroll down to inferential statistics. You surely remember, but just in case you don't, descriptive statistics is um, describing a sample. So that includes stuff like the average, the, the median, the mode, but also the standard deviation, the um, histograms, uh, and, and these sorts of things, just describing what the sample looks like. Inferential statistics then is usually the follow-up in any study that they first show you, descriptives, and then the inferential statistics, which is relationships, x causes y, um, the multiple access causes, one I, Y, uh, etc. There's all sorts of different things we could do. And the things specifically now that we will do is uh, Pearson's correlation, Pearson's R, and we'll do a regression analysis and we'll make an, a nice scatter plot. And you're asked a bunch of questions about this. So that's what we will um, do in these. So you see the screenshots to help you find the stuff in the menus. This is what SPSS will look like. Okay, so. I'm going to close this because I want to move towards showing you SPSS itself. Yeah, I have the files for SPSS here. So what I will do is just start SPSS, which if you have it installed on your computer, you can just uh, press the start button if it's Windows and then type SPSS. How to start stuff on Mac, I have no idea, but I'm sure you know how to start a program. So we, we click this. It can sometimes take a while to start. So we'll just give it some time. I have version 24 installed, as you can see. If you download it from the website, it may you may have a newer version, but it shouldn't be that different. Just to illustrate, I've used SPSS. Uh, I think when I learned it, it must have been around maybe 2004, 2005, around that time. And it looked pretty much the same. I think it wasn't bluish, but it was <laughs> otherwise similar. Okay, so when you start the program and you don't load the data set, you get this pop-up thing that asks, asks you, do you have any uh, recent files? In your case, this will most likely be empty. You can just close this and you end up with this. What you're looking at now is called the data view. You see that here, um, it's a data view. We'll be switching to variable view in a bit. It's now empty because there's no data loaded. When you download, um, the in instructions will tell you to download first practice.sav. I have it here, so I'll open it from here. So once you've downloaded it, you just double click it to open it up in SPSS. That should work. Let's see if it does it. Yeah, it pops up something called the output window. We'll get back to that in a second. And then you get to the data view again. That's one way to open up a file. Of course, as in any program, you can also go to File, Open, Data, and then you find it in this uh, in this window. Okay, two ways to open up a file. So once the file is open, this is what, what it looks like. Basically, data is just this. It's just a bunch of numbers. It might as well, as well have been a, a text file uh, showing you a bunch of numbers. And SPSS is nothing but really just a very extensive calculator that does stuff with these numbers. That's all it is. So you need to kind of pay attention to what it is you're doing exactly. And that's some of the stuff that we'll be looking at today. Um, OK, so what are you looking at? So we have the variables that are measured about a thing in the rows. 
So we have Raspener at Duke age child sex year birth. We don't exactly know what these things are at the moment, what they measure exactly, but we'll get to that. Uh, but these are your variables. And then on the rows, we have the units of observation. In this case, these are people. Yeah, so I can tell you there was a survey that was done. Uh, people were asked about these things and then it was recorded into this file. So for example, person eight has an age of 24. Person 18 has an age of 57. Okay. We don't usually spend a whole lot of time in this data view because you use it when you're entering data and maybe if you think there's clear mistakes in the data, we might fix them here. But generally we, we deal with that in a different way. But this is um, where you could enter data if you wanted to and check it out. Okay, the next window I want to show you, there's a lot of windows and pop-ups and that sort of stuff in SPSS, is the following, it's the variable view. And you see at the bottom left corner, there's two tabs, where the tab that's active is, is yellow and it's data view. But we want to switch to variable view now. And you'll see that's the same variables as before. We have, have Respender, Educ, Age, Child, Sex, Year, Birth, right? It's same as before. Now we have them on the rows rather than in the columns, and we don't have the data, but we have information about each variable. So there's different ways in which you can store uh, information, even if it is all numbers, um, which, by the way, is, is this. This, is, uh, this indicates to SPSS, this is numbers, this data. It can deal with other types, as you can see, or specific types of numbers. String means text. So there are actually exceptions to the numbers only rule, but this is not something we're getting into today. This is how many numbers uh, wide the thing is, the, the values are, how many decibels we, decimals we want to record. Not so very interesting stuff, these three. What we're interested in first is this label, which is just a description of what the variable measures. So for example, age indeed is the age of the respondent. A respondent is a person who answered, uh, answered the survey. Child is not, are they a child or not? But apparently it's the number of children they have, presumably. Sex could have been a very interesting variable, but it's just boringly sex of the respondent, etc. Yeah, so this is the other stuff. Respender is just uh, some number that they gave to everyone. Okay, so that's the label. SPSS doesn't really care about the label. It just uses it to put it ab uh, above um, tables and graphs and that sort of stuff. But mostly it's for our information to know what the data actually shows us. Then another column that's relevant to us is this one. It's called values. Right, And then for each variable, we have um, a potential um, list of what the values mean. So for example, in the data view, I'm going to switch back to that for a second, we see for sex, which we now know is the sex of the respondent, we see a bunch of zeros and ones. So this is, uh, this is a zero, it's just the way SPSS writes down a zero. Zeros and ones, I don't see anything else here. So we could have had like a third option or a fourth or uh, several options, I suppose. But in this case, we just have men and women. But which is which? Is men zero and women one or is it the other way around? We don't really know. So that's what values does. It shows us zero is male. If we click this cell, you see there's this hidden button. It shows up when you click this cell. It's a weird quirk of SPSS, if you ask me, but you know, they hide the button for some reason. When we click that, we get, ah yes, zero is male, one is female. Yeah, There's no intrinsic reason that we gave zero to male and one to female. We could have coded this very differently. We could have said uh, minus 99 is male and 1250 is female. It doesn't matter in this particular case because it's a nominal variable where we just have two different categories, but a no specific order or a not, no specific distance to one another. It's just different numbers and that's all we need. Uh, contrast that to age of the respondent where it doesn't say any values. There's none here, right? And that kind of makes sense considering that the, the values for age are the actual meaningful values. So if it says 50, that 50, it matters that it's 50 and not 49. It's the actual age of a person. So this is not the actual sex of a person. It's a number that represents a sex. This is the actual age of a person. And this is also the actual year of birth of a person. Then educational level is somewhere in between because we see it has values. It's been set up with values. And uh, the research has decided to give a uh, value one to lower education, two to middle, three to higher. Here it matters that they are in that order. We want to have a higher number for the higher value. It does not matter which exact values they are. So we could have had minus two 
uh, value one for middle education and then 99 for higher education. It doesn't matter how far apart these numbers are, but that they are different first and then also in a specific order at least. This is called an ordinal variable. Okay, so we yeah, the reason for this is that we can really say higher education is exactly three times as much as lower education. These steps are not at equal distances to one another. Okay, which would be true for age. If someone is 20 years old, that's exactly twice as old as someone who's 10 years old. If someone has 10, 10 children for some reason, that's twice as much exactly as five children. Okay. Okay, so this is the variable view. These are the main two windows that open up when you uh, start SPSS. You've noticed that it also already started output for me. Um, the output window, this is, is it's a new window. See, it's separate. In some systems, this will be grouped under one uh, uh, button at the start bar. Um, but I've disabled that. I don't like that very much. So the output window tells you everything that you do, ask it to do. So that includes things like um, bar, bar charts, uh, pie charts, all the types of charts, all the types of tables, all the types of numbers that you ask it to produce. But even if you ask it to open up a file, you see it says, this is my command internally that I use to open the file that you asked me to open up. So practice.sav and make, in my case, get file equals and then this whole thing. You don't have to remember this or even pay attention to it, but it just pops up. Don't be uh, confused by it popping up. Um, most of the stuff that we do today will be up top on this menu up here. And you'll see that this menu is actually identical to here. So most Windows and SPSS will have the same uh, list of things so that you can do your things from here or from here. It doesn't matter. It does the same thing. Today we'll be looking at this analyze menu and this graphs menu. Those are the two ones that we're exploring a bit today. And as you see, there's a whole bunch of procedures that we can do. Of course, we're not going to do all of them. We're just scratching the surface. We're just getting getting started with this. Um, let's first produce uh, a frequency table, which is a table that shows how frequent every value is. So analyze, then descriptive statistics and frequencies. There's instructions on how to do this in your um, exercises. If we do this, when we do this, we can uh, uh, use any sort of variable. We can set this up, but let's take, um, no wait, let's take number of children. You will be doing age in your exercises. I don't want to spoil it for you. Um, we could set up s several sorts of things. Let me make this slightly smaller. Here's some buttons. Here's some buttons. There's a lot of stuff. Of course, we're, there's more options that we need for today. Unfortunately, that, that can, can be confusing. But let's uh, start with the button statistics here. Uh, another pop-up. You see pop-up after pop-up. And here, can, here we set up which numbers do you want SPSS to calculate about this variable number of children. So let's say we want the, the mean, the median, the mode. And maybe we want the minimum value. So what's the lowest number of kids that someone had? I'm guessing that would be zero and the maximum. And maybe just for good measure, also a standard deviation. You're not changing any data, you're just asking about for specific types of uh, calculations from the program. Okay, continue. Um, and maybe we want to make some charts about this too. Let's say we want to have number of children. Hmm, let's say a histogram. Continue. Okay, so when, we, when we're satisfied with how we set things up, do not disable this. Um, we want this for now. And then we click OK. It thinks about it for a bit, and then your output window will show you the tables that we asked about. So we see the first statistics thing. That's these are the things after the button statistics that we asked it to make. Make. Uh, we see the mean, the median, the mode, standard deviation, minimum, which indeed is zero. And apparently, there's someone in the data with seven kids. And here we see sort of the distribution uh, and how frequent certain values were. So there's there were, let me just show you this. There are 25 people who report that they have one kid. There's 112 people who said they have three children, and there's 90 people, four, etc. And there's one person who reported seven kids. Yeah, in a histogram that looks like this. So it's that this, this is this data here, but plot there's a bar chart with equal distances between the steps. That's a histogram. And on the y-axis, we see the frequency, how frequent this value is. OK, so this is just an example. I just wanted to show you mainly the output window, because this output window just gives you, um, you know, uh, 
the output that you ask it to produce. If we were to say, let's say that I, I uh, delete someone's uh, record. So let's say we delete this person here. Clear. Just to illustrate, right? There would be one person less reporting that child, right? So in the output, the n, which is the sample size, should go from 374 to 373, correct? Because there's one person less in the data but it doesn't update it. So this output window is like a long piece of paper that keeps scrolling up, and but it only prints stuff permanently in a way. So it doesn't dynamically update the table. You have to go again to analyze descriptive statistics frequencies. It will remember how you set this up, including these things. So we just click OK. And now it thinks again, and you see 373 compared to 374. So this is the old data, new data. This hardly changes. Okay, that's how the output window works. Um, you don't have to keep this tidy. The way people use this is they kind of work with the, the menus and the data until they are happy with what they have and then they copy paste from this program uh, to Word or PowerPoint or whatever it is you want to you want to use for this. Um, yeah, so the output window and that it prints and that it does that. I'm just thinking what to cover. While we're here, um, one thing that I wanted to show you is this graphs menu. In the exercise, you'll see it. It's uh, what we'll use is graphs and then chart builder. And then the chart builder looks like this. First of all, we can set, let's set up a pie chart. We do this by dragging. So here is the categories of charts. And then once you find it, you drag it here. And there's a lot of dragging in this window for some reason. Before you get to this window, it wants you to set up the variables uh, in the way they are measured. I, I'll show you that in a, in a minute. Uh, but let's take um, sex of the respondent, and it's a nominal variable. If we want to add that here, it, we, need, we just need to drag it to slice by. You see it becomes red, and that works. If we try to say age of the respondent, it won't take it. The reason for this is that it's set up as a scale variable. And a scale variable, so um, a continuous variable from, in this case, 0 to 83, I believe, it won't make a lot of sense because it will give us like a whole lot of, uh, let's cheat and, and show you what it kind of looks like, right? So if you would make a pie chart for age, it looks a little ridiculous. Yeah? No point in making this. The reason is that there's a separate slice for each single age. So for this type of variable, we don't necessarily use something like a pie chart. There will be a question about that too. Um, let's say sex of the respondent and make a pie chart out of that. I want to show you the chart editor. And you get there by double clicking in the output window, the graph that you've made. That works for other graphs as well and even tables. That opens up yet another window, which is called the chart editor. In the chart editor, we can add uh, things. We can change the color of things. We can make this a nice different shade of blue, for example, uh, green, sorry. Um, and you see that it updates the legend here as well. Yeah, so if you want to pretty things up, you can do that. You can also change the fonts and delete stuff. You can remove uh, things from the data, uh, whatever, not the data from the from the visualization. Okay, but what you'll be doing in the exercise, we'll be doing so adding percentages to this, which is elements, and then show data labels, the labels to the data, okay? In this case, the default will be percentages, but you see in this window, you can set this up to be different. So you can also say the count, which is how, how many we see. Now we have both. Okay, so you can play with this. And then when you close that window, chart editor, it updates it to your output window. Um, okay, so this is the main things I wanted to show you. Okay, so yeah, so the, the only thing that uh, is left, I think, if I'm not mistaken, will be how you set up two more columns, which is this missing and which is this measure. Missing is used for, uh, in cases, for example, when people in a survey didn't want to give us an answer to a certain question. Let's say that we ask people for their uh, monthly income, and that's a typical question that people don't want to answer sometimes. Instead of just, say, just leaving that blank in the data here, we might use a special value to do that. So something that's clearly outside the range. So let's say for argument's sake that the range for income would be between zero a month and 100,000 a month. Um, then a, a, a number clearly outside of that range might be minus five or minus 99. Like a negative number clearly would be outside of that. Uh, so that might be a, a useful number to use. I'll give you a little hint 
for age there is such a number and I think we found a couple of vampires here and they these might be such a similar case the issue that you'll find is that the researchers didn't actually put that into their missing values so let's do that here age of the respondent a missing value again notice the, the hidden button will be 998 in this case if we click OK, this does not change the data. You see these people are still here. It's not changing the data itself. It's just telling SPSS to deal with the data slightly differently. Um, and so now when we would produce um, the average or uh, whatnot for age, it will exclude the people who have 998. It will still show them as missing, but they are no longer included in the calculations for charts, but also averages and, th and things like that. Okay, so that's uh, missing values. So you need to uh, know how to use that. And then finally, we have measure. Measure is uh, SPSS's uh, way of saying we have nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio variables. In the case of SPSS, and mathematically, there's no difference between interval and ratio, but you, know, you will need to know this because people in the future might refer to this. I'll let you kind of play around with what is what exactly, but it's important just for the graphs window how you set this up. It, there it matters because, like I showed you, it won't let you, let you do this because it sees it's uh, set up as skill, yeah? But there will be some that you want to change here to nominal or ordinal. Um, that is it for now. Um, there will be other instructions in the future if we, uh, if we decide to do an assessment specifically on this topic, um, but that will be uh, announced later if it applies. For now, good luck with the exercises. So again, go to lab session, um, folder and then lab session exercise instructions will take you from there. We do not need you to send us your work. The notes that you make are notes for yourself in order to, make, to be able to learn how to do this. Um, and uh, you can work together on this uh, on these exercises with a, with a friend if you want to, um, either in person or remotely, of course. Um, and that's really it. That's all I have to say. So um, good luck and um, see you soon in, in research methods. Bye bye.